Hi, uh, I'm Mike Keenan, the Director of Planning and Strategy here at the Port of Los Angeles, and my presentation today is about a Port 101, an overview of the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles is actually part of a larger port complex uh, at the southern tip of the, the city of Los Angeles and jointly the city of Long Beach. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach are essentially a single large co complex that we call the San Pedro Bay Port Complex, uh, separated by an imaginary dotted line down the middle. The Port of Los Angeles is bounded uh, by the city areas of uh, San Pedro to the west and Wilmington to the north. and Together, this is the busiest port complex uh, handling containers uh, in North America. The Port of Los Angeles was founded in 1907, um, and it sits on state title and trust land, meaning the, coast, the coastal areas of the state of California are held in trust for the benefit of the people of California. And we are specifically supposed to be a port engaged in commerce, navigation, fisheries, recreational areas, which helps preserve the rest of California's uh, coastal area for a lot more recreational activities and preservation of nature. Uh, we're not supported by any taxpayer funds directly. We instead are a proprietary department of the city of Los Angeles that is supported primarily by the revenue that we generate from the trade that flows through the port. Our port model is not an operator port. We are more of a hybrid model, meaning on the East Coast and elsewhere on the West Coast, there are ports where the port authority actually operates the terminals themselves and hires the labor um, and does all of those negotiations with the business partners. Whereas we are primarily a landlord port, leasing out to tenants, marine terminal operators primarily, who do the negotiating with the labor unions and work out the, the staffing and operating of the terminals. We're governed by a five-member Board of Harbor Commissioners appointed by the mayor of the city, and we're a fairly large complex encompassing about 4,300 acres of land and 3,200 acres of, of water. Uh, we've got 270 berths and 27 cargo terminals, primarily handling containers, but also handling liquid bulk, uh, like oil and refined products. Uh, we handle fruit and steel and scrap metal. Autos uh, come through here and it's a very large operation. Uh, as a proprietary department of the city of Los Angeles, similar to the Department of Water and Power and the airport, again, we're not funded by the general fund of the city, uh, although we are governed by a board of harbor commissioners appointed by the mayor. And we operate the port, not just for the benefit of the city, but for the benefit of all the people of California. Uh, that means that the revenue that's generated from the port has to be reinvested in the port. It doesn't go to the city except for certain services that we pay the city for, that they provide to us. For example, a fire service would be something that we pay the city for. Otherwise, the revenue that's generated here needs to be reinvested to uh, keep this port operating, expanded, and provide the benefits that it provides for everyone in California. And the terminal operators themselves are also governed by the federal government, uh, which keeps them from colluding with one another, ensures that they compete um, to make sure that trade practices are fair and the laws of the city and the state and the country are, are followed here. Back in 1907, most of this uh, land area here was you know, sandbars uh, and some kind of natural, a uh, little bit of a natural harbor, but a lot of wharves and, and docks uh, that, were, that were built at the time. And it's very different now. Um, and the main reason it's different is that back in the 1980s, uh, seeing the rise of international trade, the mayor, Tom Bradley, uh, and the general manager of the Port of Los Angeles at the time, uh, E.Z. Burt, worked to start developing a plan for how the port uh, could expand to handle the rise of containerized cargo. Because before containerization started, cargo moved in, in nets and in boxes and barrels and bundles. And there was a lot of labor involved uh, with just people hauling things off and on uh, uh, ships. Um, and the rise in containerization, the idea that you could take this cargo and then pack it into these large shipping containers, uh, essentially, you know, initially 20 foot long, but now primarily 40 foot long boxes that stack and snap together like Legos, uh, could really improve the efficiency of uh, moving cargo, meant that ports had to change. Uh, in how they, they physically were laid out, how terminals were set up. Um, 
you didn't have to have, you know, a, a ship on these narrow finger piers with a lot of, you know, space for people to go up and down gangplanks. But instead, you'd need much longer berths for larger ships where these giant mechanized cranes would lift the Lego boxes off and then put them onto, onto trucks or stack them onto terminals. Um, and so the 2020 plan was an expansion project that took uh, the benefits of another development project, which is these larger ships mean, meant that the water needed to be deeper. There was a huge dredging project to make the water deep enough to handle these larger ships. And then the, the dredged material, the dirt, got repurposed into building out uh, Piers 300 and Piers 400, uh, which were our newest container terminals that were large, uh, rectangular shaped set up for uh, handling these container vessels. Um, and Pier 400 still today is the largest proprietary uh, container terminal in the world. Uh, it covers about 484 acres. Uh, you could put multiple Disneylands uh, onto the land that uh, Pier 400 uh, covers. This development in the 80s, leading to what the port should look like in 2020, has been completed. Um, we added on-dock rail, these uh, mega terminals, um, and also additional bridge projects and rail projects, uh, including the Alameda Corridor, which was done to bring a lot of the, the rail transport uh, to below grade, uh, meaning there's a very long trench that uh, trains can run through uninterrupted. They don't stop car traffic, and car traffic doesn't stop the trains, it makes them work in harmony. Um, these types of developments really enabled us to grow and become um, a major import center for the United States. How big are we? In 2019, we handled about 9.3 million TEUs. A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. As I said before, when I was talking about the rise of containerization, the original boxes were about 20 feet long. Not about, they were exactly 20 feet long. Uh, and that was the standard size. Uh, and then as technology developed, uh, the industry moved primarily to 40 foot long containers. Uh, but because there's still 20 foot containers out there um, and the, the record keeping and port measurements were pretty much set uh, in stone already, the this industry practice was essentially to just keep counting things as the equivalent of 20 foot units. So one 40-foot container is equivalent to two 20-foot containers. So when I say we handled about 9.3 million TEUs, that means that roughly about four and a half million uh, containers, 40-foot containers, uh, moved through this complex. Each of them can fill, carry as much stuff as fits in your house. You're talking, you know, 10 to, uh, you know, 20 or 40 tons of cargo, depending on what you're moving in them. Uh, can be handled one of those vessels. Uh, 9.3 million TUs was actually the third best year uh, in our 113 year history. It was a slight decline from the previous year and the main reason that we saw less cargo than we did in the previous year is because uh, we're currently, uh, among other things, uh, engaged in more of a, a trade dispute with our largest trading partner, China. This meant that you know, we were a little bit lower than the previous year. Um, that effect is uh, still continuing this year. And on top of that, uh, with COVID-19 and the, the broad impacts on the economy uh, that, that we've seen from that, we're expecting cargo volume this year to be lower than that, perhaps about uh, 8.9 million TEUs. Although we've seen a resurgence in cargo uh, in August and September, um, as the economy gets better and also some spending gets shifted uh, from uh, activities that we can't take part in, like going out, dining out, going to movies, a lot more of that spending is getting repurposed into uh, buying things, fixing up your house. If you're gonna spend this much time inside your house, home improvement projects suddenly take on a new priority. But in 2019, with the, the impacts of the trade disputes with China, we did see declines um, in our major categories of trade. And as I said, we cover just about everything here. Uh, we handle cars, scrap metal, steel, liquid bulk, fruit, uh, passenger cruises, which were improving in 2019, uh, not so much in, in 2020. Uh, 
and uh, visitors as well, because in addition to handling all of this trade, which is the main purpose of the Port of Los Angeles, we're also part of our neighboring communities. The San communities of San Pedro and Wilmington um, used to be more coastal communities and have had part of their coastline now dedicated to an industrial facility uh, that is you know, beneficial to the local economy and the statewide and national economy, but does come with a cost. Um, actually comes with several costs, which I'll get into, uh, but one of which is just the, the loss of some of the waterfront opportunities that you would normally have if you were living in a coastal community. And so uh, some of the effort that the port has done um, in partnership with the community, partly driven by um, you know, response to community suggestions, community demands, has been the, the redevelopment of the San Pedro waterfront and the Wilmington waterfront, um, and the activities that we do here to try to bring visitors to the waterfront, in addition to doing development to, to fix it up and add other attractions. There's a lot of community work we do as well to have special events that, that uh, bring the community in and, and give more opportunities for people to enjoy some of the benefits that you really should have living in a coastal community. And finally, as I stated before, TEUs were down uh, about 1.3% uh, versus the previous year. And of course, that is going to be our, our major category of trade, ca carrying just about everything that uh, people buy in stores uh, and things that uh, the United States sells to other countries. The main impacts of the last two and a half years of uh, trade dispute with China followed by almost a full year of uh, dealing with COVID-19 um, has been felt across all aspects of our, our trade. There's been disruption to supply chains because the increased tariffs on goods coming from China has meant companies have had to look elsewhere for where they are going to get some of the, the raw materials they work with or some of the supplies that they need for their manufacturing or retail efforts. One of the ways that can happen is that you look for other countries to be uh, your, your new trading partner. And while we are the primary gateway for trade from China because we are the closest, fastest route uh, to get cargo from Northeast Asia to the rest of the United States. It's also the, our primary uh, relationships with, uh, with Japan. As manufacturing uh, shifts to countries more in Southeast Asia, that puts the, the trading routes a little bit closer uh, to the East Coast than they used to be, which means it's more of a toss-up for you if you're trying to decide whether you want your cargo to move through West Coast ports or through East Coast ports. So that's hurt our volumes a bit. Now, as I said to say before, we're seeing trade demand increasing again for you know, home improvement projects. We're doing a lot more uh, online shopping, uh, some retails bouncing back. And because of the big cutbacks at the start of the year when people were more uncertain about what the, the shape of the economic impacts were going to be, companies you know, reduced a lot of their ordering, uh, used a lot more of the inventory they already had in stock, and now need to start restocking a bunch of that as well. So now we're seeing that our volumes are about 80 to 85 to about 90% of what our, our normal volumes would be for this point of year. It's not a great thing to see because lower cargo volumes means that there's less economic activity that goes with that. Uh, there's fewer hours of labor available for longshore workers to move the cargo on and off the vessels. Fewer jobs available for truck drivers moving the cargo in and out of the, the port and fewer jobs at, uh, at warehouses and distribution centers. So we like to see trade rebound. And uh, with the impact of the tariffs that we've put on uh, other countries, some, there's some been some retaliation, and that impacts our ability to be uh, competitive. Um, if one of your major trading partners, like China, decides that they're also going to buy less from you in exchange for you wanting to buy less from them, that widens out the, the trade gap, and we've lost some markets for exports like, like soybeans and corn, a lot of the stuff that um, we, we provide to China in exchange for the things we buy from them it's gonna widen the trade gap. So it hasn't necessarily been the most uh, beneficial or intended outcome of the tariffs that have been placed on uh, during under the current administration. Uh, still, despite th uh, these impacts, uh, the Port of Los Angeles uh, is still the, the nation's largest, busiest container port, followed closely by uh, the Port of Long Beach. They handled about 8.1 million TEUs. Combined 
we're twice as large as the next nearest competitor in the U.S., which would be the port complex of New York and New Jersey. And if LA and Long Beach were actually combined into, a, counted as, as a single port complex, if you recorded it officially as the San Pedro Bay port complex, uh, then we'd actually be the ninth busiest container port in the world. Everybody benefits by having the two largest uh, container ports uh, in the nation uh, competing with one another rather than taking advantage of their market position and potentially raising costs uh, instead. That doesn't mean that we can't and don't coordinate on things that don't have a competitive impact uh, on price, uh, but can have a lot of beneficial uh, impacts for the community. Who do we do business with? Well, our top trading partner, of course, is China, followed by Japan, and then Vietnam has become a very large trading partner for us as well. Over just the past five or six years, it went from not being in the top five at all to now being the third largest trading partner uh, that we work with. South Korea is also a very large uh, trading partner, as is Taiwan. If you look at what is coming into uh, the U.S., the biggest imports that we have in terms of volume are going to be furniture but we also bring in a lot of auto parts in addition to finished vehicles. Everything you own that says made in China on it most likely came through the Port of Los Angeles. What goes out of the Port of Los Angeles is, is a tricky question here, or actually it's an easy question that requires a little bit more explanation though for context, because our biggest export um, is, in terms of volume, is waste paper followed by animal feeds. That's gonna be primarily hay uh, and alfalfa from the Central Valley of California. Um, destined for countries like Japan, where if you want to, if you want to raise Kobe beef, not a lot of grazing land in, in Japan, so uh, the feed has to come from somewhere, and it comes from here. Uh, really high value, uh, really low weight products are going to move via air freight uh, instead of by a shipping vessel. When you just look at trade that just moves through one piece of the whole trade puzzle, just things that go in containers in and out of the Port of Los Angeles, Yes, you see that there's a lot of high, relatively high value or medium value products uh, that are suitable for shipping coming in and imports and a lot of you know, lower value goods uh, filling up a lot of containers moving out. But that's just a piece of the trade puzzle uh, and doesn't tell you everything you need to know about how much an impact trade has on our lives, our communities and, and the nation. Um, speaking about that impact, um, the Port of Los Angeles itself has about 900 employees uh, on it, just doing the administrative functions of running the port, you know, as well as uh, doing kind of our own construction and maintenance as, as landlords for, for these tenants. There's about, anytime there's about 10 to 15,000 uh, longshore workers who actually do the labor on the container terminals. Combined with the Port of Long Beach, there's about 190,000 jobs in our two cities, LA and Long Beach, that are, are tied to the port. And if you look at the state, almost a, a million jobs in the state are tied to trade that moves through this port complex. Nationally, about three million jobs in some way are, are tied to trade that moves through this trade gateway. And it's every single congressional district uh, in the United States has uh, companies in it that either export or import goods through the ports of LA and Long Beach. All told, that's about almost $90 billion worth of California goods and about $311 billion of, of trade nationally moves through this port complex, which is why it's important for us to uh, keep developing this port complex. And as I said previously, the revenue that we generate, a small you know, fee that's charged on every container, for example, that moves through the port, um, is destined for reinvestment in the port. And over the next few fiscal years, we're gonna invest about $367 million on various modernization projects uh, that improve the transportation network, that are terminal improvements, and some of that gets reinvested into the types of developments that serve the communities, including additional development of the San Pedro and Wilmington waterfronts. This type of development, especially the, the rail and road infrastructure development that we can do here, is important because cargo flows through here as it is the fastest gateway to where your customers are. It's your connection to all of the United States. The reason you send cargo here is, well, first, we have a very large local market. There's about 22 million people in kind of the greater Southern California area that 
first off, if you're gonna send cargo to the United States, there's at least 22 million people here that can benefit from this being your first stop. But in addition to that, there's also a large network of warehouse and distribution centers that are built both nearby the port and further out in the Inland Empire. As a result, um, we end up being the locus for a lot of international trade destined for the entire United States. We've got fast connectivity to the rest of the, of the, of the nation. Uh, we're served by the two class one railroads, the BNSF and the UP, which are both you know, national in scope. They can get uh, cargo to uh, Eastern railroads within a handful of days, five days to Chicago on average, and express trains can run it even faster. And it takes about 13 days to get cargo from say China across the Pacific Ocean to Los Angeles. So you add on another five days of rail, your cargo can be uh, in Chicago about 18 days or less after leaving the factory floor in China. If you're going to take that cargo uh, to an East Coast port, uh, and you're gonna go through the Panama Canal, it's 26 days just to get your cargo into an East Coast port like New York. And then it's going to be an additional few days of rail time to get that cargo to that same place in Chicago. So that's our, our major advantage here. You send cargo to Los Angeles, you're really quickly sending it to the rest of the United States because we have access to all the major rail hubs um, and it does provide the, the fastest, most reliable service that you can get um, when trying to serve the very large, very diverse, very spread out American population. There is a cost to this trade though, um, and it comes with pollution. Um, having all these trucks and trains handling a nation's worth of cargo um, brings with it uh, pollution, um, um, especially from uh, diesel trucks. Um, and in the, by the mid 2000s, uh, it was clear to everyone that this was uh, an untenable situation. So back in 2006, um, LA and Long Beach uh, jointly coordinated on coming up with a joint clean air action plan, a set of measures that we would do uh, in conjunction with one another to improve the, the environment, to reduce the impacts uh, that that have to go with uh, international trade. The Clean Air Action Plan has been upda updated again in 2017. It's updated again now. Um, as we hit all of these goals, um, we keep setting the bar higher for ourselves. Uh, the original goals that we'd set, we wanted to reach certain targets and reduce these pollutants, especially things like diesel particulate matters and sulfur oxides. Uh, we wanted to re reduce those by 2023. And we hit those targets years in advance. We're very far ahead of the game, but that doesn't mean we're done. There's always more that we can do. The easiest thing for us to do was to get rid of the dirtiest trucks. Um, and now everything has to have um, engines that are compliant with the latest environmental standards. That brought about you know, this huge change um, and in environmental progress. Um, the next challenge for us is going to be how do you not simply move people from getting rid of their old stuff and buying newly available, just get a, a newer truck that's cleaner, but pushing people to technologies that are still in the process of being developed. Um, if now you care about greenhouse gases as well, how do we move people to zero emission technologies when you just can't buy them off the shelf? You can't, their companies are still doing research and development. They're still trying to find what is the best path forward. Um, so we're working on a, a clean truck right now uh, that could generate some, a lot of um, investment money that we can then give to help develop some of these pilot programs and help trucking companies uh, do the investment and research to come up with the next big thing. Also, while the original clean truck program could make that step of let's push people to just get rid of their older trucks that are way out of compliance and get newly available trucks that are currently available that are cleaner. We could do that on our own. We're only a piece of a statewide transportation uh, system and it's not enough to just fix our tiny piece of the puzzle because as much as I, we like to say, and truly, we are the nation's busiest container port and we're a major economic engine here. When it comes to how many trucks move through here, we're a drop in the bucket when you look at a major truck manufacturer. 15,000 trucks is 
you know, a handful of days production uh, versus something you'd actually want to, like it's not a giant market for you to move to. And to get real change in the state, we need statewide changes, which is why we're working with the California Air Resources Board on rules that would uh, help change trucking for, for the state as a whole. And there's been a lot of progress on this coming out of the, the, the state capitol, and we're happy to be a part of that. What we can do right now is continue what we're doing on aggressively testing kind of these zero and near zero trucks, these technologies to see how they work in these really intensive drayage environments report where they need to have these short dirty duty cycles or these long duty cycles where the batteries need to last long enough for cargo to these trucks to be hauling very heavy cargo for very long periods of time or up and over really steep hills out of the valleys of Southern California. Um, it's a big challenge for us, but it's one that we're actually happy to take on. Uh, the reason we are where we are today is based back in the 80s, uh, people looked at where they wanted to be in 2020, and we're, we're here now. Where do we want to be in 2035? Where do we want to be in, in 2050? Those are the decisions that we here at the port are, are making today with community involvement, with stakeholder engagement, with uh, the state and federal help. Uh, this is a problem we really need to get our hands around. And it's an exciting challenge to be working on because trade is good. The, the benefits of the port of Los Angeles uh, to the local communities and to the, the state and the nation as a whole uh, are, are really important. And it's work we're happy to be doing. Uh, I hope this gives you a good overview of where the port came from and where we're trying to take it today, how important it is, and exactly what exactly do we do here. Um, so on that note, I want to thank you all for your, your time and your, your patience with this. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Thank you. <laughs>